Thank you, Senator Dodson. It being almost 2 p.m., I'll ask senators to take their seats. We'll move to question time. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In question time yesterday, Mr. Morrison falsely claimed that former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd had travelled in and out of Australia while the borders were closed. What is this Prime Minister's problem with telling the truth? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Well, I believe the Prime Minister has, uh, has tabled a response in the House uh, addressing those matters. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Yesterday, Mr Morrison claimed he'd exceeded his promise to get 26,200 stranded Australians home by Christmas. Isn't it the case that at least 9,000 of those registered to come home when he made that promise are still stranded? I again ask, what is this Prime Minister's problem with telling the truth? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr President, since September 18, more than 43,000 uh, Australians have returned home. More than 43,000 have returned home since September 18. Uh, over 17,000 of these passengers were registered with DFAT, uh, including more than 3,700 vulnerable Australians. Uh, of course, since the government provided advice to Australians overseas to reconsider the need to travel abroad and to return home, more than 432,000 people have returned home, uh, a significant number passing through the type of quarantine places established across Australia. Those quarantine places are capped and are limited. We are working, as we have been, as closely with the states as possible to make sure there are as many opportunities as can be for Australians to return home, but to do so in a way that poses no threat to the safety Order. of Australia Senator and our management of COVID. Has expired. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. On 12 November, Mr Morrison promised stranded Australians that, and I quote, there is a queue and Australians are at the front of the queue. But the government's own data shows that in October, only 50 per cent of the seats on planes arriving in Australia were filled by Australian citizens. What is this Prime Minister's problem with telling the truth? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, our government, to make sure that we give priority to Australians, has been chartering flights, Order. facilitating flights. And I can tell you on those flights, Absolutely, priority is firmly, squarely given to Australians. Order there are, of course, commercial left. flights as well that the government does not facilitate tickets on, but the government has made sure that criteria, criteria for those who may not be Australians returning home are tight. Those criteria include, include circumstances where individuals may be the partner of an Australian citizen. With rights to reside here, these are often compassionate circumstances or circumstances that are essential to the function of government or otherwise. Our effort has been on getting Australians home, but also doing so Order. in a way that maintains Australia's safe management of Order COVID-19. Senator. Senator Small. I advise the Chamber that this is not my first speech, but I have a question for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business and a fellow West Australian, Senator Cash. <laughs> Minister, through bushfires and COVID-19, this year has seen unprecedented pressure on the Australian labour market. Could the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government has supported Australians through this once-in-a-century pandemic to stay connected to the labour force, to find employment and, indeed, the skills that they need to re-enter the workforce? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank my fellow Western Australian Senator, Senator Small, and I do acknowledge that this is these are the first question that he has asked in this place. Uh, but can I also acknowledge that he very much comes to this place representing uh, the backbone of the Australian economy, uh, because one of the hats that he has worn uh, is as a small business owner, someone who knows what it's like uh, to have sleepless nights, uh, to employ people uh, and to build up a business. And uh, in that respect, uh, he's certainly a welcome skill set in the Senate. So congratulations, Senator Small. But Mr President, um, as Australians would be aware, 
We have performed better than other nations when it comes to uh, the health response to COVID-19, uh, and certainly on the economic front, when we look at nearly every other country uh, in the world. What we are now seeing, though, is the beginning of the labour force recovery. And over the last few months, we've seen it's around 648,000 500 Australians returning to work as lockdowns ease. Um, and as is now evident, as you ease those restrictions, as you ease those lockdowns, more and more businesses are able to open their doors uh, and more and more Australians are able to return to work. Uh, our JobKeeper program has been, of course, instrumental in keeping employees connected to their employment. Uh, it is Australia's largest wage subsidy program and uh, it has kept around 3.8 million Australians connected to their employer, and it's directly saved, it is estimated, at least 700,000 jobs, uh, building the foundation for our economic recovery. However, Mr President, as the Prime Minister says, we know that uh, there remains a long road ahead. And certainly when you look at the employment services uh, caseload, it has increased substantially since COVID-19 hit. At the onset of COVID-19, though, the government had acted quickly to ensure that our employment services providers Order. was Senator resourced Cash, to deal with the, the influx. Order. Senator Cash, time for the answer Senator Small, a supplementary question. Indeed, Mr President. Uh, Minister, how will the government's $74 billion jobmaker plan Build on the success of our existing employment services programs as we build, rebuild a stronger economy as part of our comeback, Senator Watt, from COVID-19. Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, certainly the government has a number of employment programs, and these employment programs are designed to get people off welfare and into a job. Uh, and these include, Order. of course, Job Active, our Youth Jobs Path program, which looks at preparing our young people uh, who are at risk of long term unemployment, uh, giving them the skills they need and the opportunity uh, to undertake work, and, of course, Parents Next, uh, which is a pre employment program designed uh, for parents uh, whose youngest child is entering school age. Age, and they need to get job ready. Uh, as a government, we have in place the programs uh, that are specifically designed to improve the employability of Australians so that they are able to take that next step and gain employment. And certainly, as we emerge from COVID-19, the government wants to build on the record that we already have and improve services for our most affected regions, but also for our most disadvantaged job seekers putting in place the policy framework to ensure that those most disadvantaged Order, are Cash. able to get Time into work. Time for the answers expired. A final supplementary question, Senator Small. Mr President, uh, can the minister outline how these programs will interact with the record investment the Morrison government has provided in skills and training to support job seekers to get the skills that they need to find new employment as the labour market recovers? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, as this government knows, all of our policies work together. They work together to strengthen the economy so that businesses can reopen their doors uh, and employ more Australians. The policies work together as part of our $74 billion job maker plan. And Mr. President, along with putting in place the economic framework required for growth, our employment programs themselves they support out-of-work Australians into training and vocational pathways to ensure that they have the skills that they need to get a job. And of course, this now works in conjunction with the $1 billion Job Trainer Fund, which provides up to 320,000 free or low-cost training places in areas of actual skills demand. We've worked, as I've said previously, with the states and territories on the ground to understand their actual labour market demand so that when people are looking at putting their hand up and undertaking these free or low-cost courses, they are getting skilled up for actual areas of labour market order. demand Senator in that Cash, particular state or territory. Time the answer has expired. Order. Order. On my... Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rastin. An Anglicare survey found that under the old rate of job seeker in March, 72 per cent of respondents skipped meals every week, with most skipping an average of three or four meals a week. How many job seeker recipients will be forced to skip meals because the Morrison government is refusing to grant a permanent increase? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. President, and I, and I thank the, the Senator for her, uh, for her question. 
Um, well, uh, I acknowledge the, the report today, uh, the Angle Care report, which um, sets out its findings from a, a, a limited survey of 618 people around their attitudes towards income Order. support payments and mutual Order. obligations. I am unaware um, of whether this survey is a, is a representative survey, but I would point out that it is exactly that. It is, is a survey. Um, but one of the things that I, I would say, um, Senator uh, McAllister, is that we on this side know through massive amounts of validated research um, across many different organisations uh, and, and speaking to many Australians that we know that the best way to improve outcomes for people, the best way that we can improve um, their well-being and their livelihoods, is to make sure that we have a strong economy that creates jobs so people have got jobs. Because we know from surveys such as the Hilda survey that people who live in a household that do not have uh, um, employment income are much more likely to have worse wellbeing outcomes than those people that live in houses where uh, income uh, is generated through employment. So, um, you know, whilst obviously we will continue order, to work— Senator Rustin. Senator McAllister on a point of order. Yes, my point of order goes to relevance. Uh, the minister has uh, indicated that she doesn't necessarily accept the Anglicare survey results, but my question really was about how many job seeker recipients she considers will be forced to skip meals. If she doesn't accept the Anglicare results, I'd appreciate understanding what her understanding Senator of the consequences Senator McAllister, with respect, are. You, you strayed from a point of order there towards the end. Um, the minister can be directly relevant while she is talking about the survey, while she is talking about job seeker or one of the other elements of your question. Um, and so, to that extent, the minister is being directly relevant. Um, I can't instruct her how to answer the question. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and uh, I would, would go on to say that, that the most important thing that we can do to make sure that people have got um, have got the best possible opportunity um, to be able to uh, to have the, the well-being that, that we all would like every Australian to have is to make sure that there are jobs in the economy so people can go to jobs. Uh, I'd also point out that the government remains Order. committed to supporting Australians through this pandemic. In fact, um, you know, in in a minute coming into this place will be uh, some legislation that we seek to extend the coronavirus supplement yeah. to enable people to be able to have that additional level of support as we recover. Cover from this pandemic. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Following the, additional, uh, the initial reduction to the coronavirus supplement, an ACOS survey found in September that 80 per cent of respondents would skip meals and reduce their intake of fresh fruit and vegetables. How many children will be forced to skip meals and miss out on fresh fruit and vegetables because the Morrison government is refusing to grant a permanent increase to job seeker support to their parents? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, as this place um, must acknowledge, um, since March, when we had came into this place and collectively, as everybody in this place, made a decision that we would put additional support in place for all Australians to help them through this, uh, the, this once in a century pandemic. Um, we Order. have had in place since then elevated levels of support through welfare payments, through the coronavirus supplement or through other payments that were made um, through stimulus payments. But at the same time, we also worked uh, through the employment um, situation to make sure we kept people engaged with their employers through the JobKeeper program. These measures are still order. in place. They order. remain Senator in place now and they will continue Senator to Wong be in place. On a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. This is a question that goes to an issue the Senate is keen to hear an answer on, and which is Australian children being forced to skip meals and miss out on fresh fruit and vegetables. And I would ask you to ask the minister to return to the question. Um, the minister can be directly relevant to this question by addressing the matters you raised, Senator Wong. The preface to that part of the question also includes a reference to the supplement payment. The minister is in order if she is addressing any part of the question. Um, and I believe she is directly relevant at the moment in doing that. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, one of the, uh, the great hallmarks of Australia's welfare system is that it is comprehensive and it is targeted. And in addition to the payments, the elevated level of payments that are currently available to people on welfare, uh, we also have a number of other payments Order. to Senator support Senator Rustin, them. time has expired. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. 
Why is the Morrison government prioritising spending $15 million of taxpayers' money on a marketing campaign, praising a comeback, while leaving Australians behind and forcing them to skip meals during the deepest recession in almost a century? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, during the last, uh, in 2019, um, this government um, spent in excess of $200 billion supporting Australians through our very comprehensive welfare system. And I can assure you, uh, Senator McAllister, in 2020, the amount of support that has been provided to the Australian public who find Senator themselves Watt. on tough times will be significantly higher than that $200 billion that was spent in the previous year. Because we as a government, with the support of those opposite and those, uh, everyone in this chamber and in the other place, um, voted to support Australians with ever elevated levels of payment during that time. Uh, so, uh, in, in response to your, your, your question, um, the, this government has stood side by side with Australians who have done it tough through this pandemic. We remain side by side with those Order. people and we will continue Order. to support them Senator for as long Rustin, as Senator Rustin, time for the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Environment Minister, Senator Birmingham. A recent paper in top scientific journal Nature showed that after three severe mass coral bleachings in just five years, the coral cover of the Great Barrier Reef is now at 50 per cent. Half the corals are dead. Dead coral does not grow back. It's climate change that is the primary cause of that loss. How much of the Great Barrier Reef has to die before this government will adopt a climate policy that isn't written by the fossil fuel industry? Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. And I completely reject the assertion made by Senator Waters. Completely reject the assertion at the end of her question there. Our government, our government consistently has worked to make sure that Australia has the policies in place to implement the commitments that Australia has made through the Kyoto Protocol, through stage two of the Kyoto Protocol commitment period, and we now continue to work hard to implement policies necessary to meet our commitments in relation to the Paris Agreement. We have done that, recognising that Australia alone doesn't solve the issues in relation to climate change. Australia alone plays a role, and I'll, I'll, take, I'll take Senator Wish Wilson's interjection quite, uh, quite happily, Mr. President. The leadership we've shown as a country is the leadership of a nation who makes commitments, delivers on our commitments, and exceeds on the delivery of our commitments. We will be quite happy, we will be quite happy to go anywhere and explain. Australia's achievements, the achievements of Australian businesses, Order. of Australian people, of Australian farmers, of all of those Australians who have contributed towards reducing Australia's emissions, who have enabled Australia to reduce our emissions by 16.6 per cent since 2005. And we have done so knowing that these steps around global cooperation are necessary to tackle issues including related to the protection of the Great Barrier Reef. We know that Australia alone won't achieve it, but we believe we set a high standard by delivering on our commitments, by exceeding those commitments and by demonstrating to the world that you can do it as a nation at home, as Australian businesses, households and farmers have successfully done and continue to do so. Senator Ward has a supplementary question. Thank you, President. Last week, in its three yearly World Heritage Outlook, the IUCN downgraded the outlook for the Great Barrier Reef to the most severe listing possible. Critical. Due to the threat posed by climate change and water quality. Next year, the World Heritage Committee will once again consider whether to list the Great Barrier Reef as World Heritage in Danger. This is the last warning that Australia is going to get before a potential in danger listing that would decimate the tourism industry. Will you treat this as a wake-up call Senator or Waters, not? Senator Waters, time for the questions expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, in addition to the action that Australia has taken uh, on emissions reduction uh, and that we continue to take uh, in collaboration with the rest of the world, we have absolutely acted to invest uh, through our reef plans in co collaboration with the Queensland government to tackle 
other threats and challenges to the Great Barrier Reef. We know that sedimentary runoff can and does have a real impact in relation to water quality in the reef, and that's why we've invested in a range of different practical initiatives to be able to support and improve that water quality in the reef, to tackle practical issues like the crown of thorn starfish uh, and ensure that works to minimise and eradicate the impact of crown, and thor crown of thorns continue as a result of the type of investments made by our government across a range of different mechanisms to support the reef health and to ensure it continues to be a crucial asset for Australia and our ecology. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. The reason for both the mass coral deaths and the IUCN outlook of critical is climate change. At one and a half degrees, we lose uh, 90 per cent of global coral reefs, and at two degrees, we lose all of them. Your government's policies have us on track for 4.4 degrees of warming. When will you adopt strong 2030 targets and an actual climate plan to give the reef any hope of survival? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, a few points. There. Firstly, is the oversimplification of the challenges the reef faces by the Australian Greens. I cited in my previous answer issues around water quality, issues around crown of thorn starfish. There are real issues in addition to the work to be done on climate change, and we continue to make sure that we tackle all of those issues as part of a comprehensive reef management plan that we have worked, despite political and other differences, with Queensland governments to fund and to implement and to deliver over a period of time. When it comes, Mr President, to the work around emissions reduction, I again point to the fact that Australia, since 2005, has achieved a 16.6 .6 reduction in our emissions. New Zealand has reduced theirs over a similar period of time by 1 per cent. Canada has largely flatlined. The OECD average is around 9 per cent. So, Mr. President, when it Order. comes to domestic Senator emissions Birmingham, reductions, Australia stands tall. Has expired. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Senator Birmingham. Minister, as you know, wine exports are a billion-dollar industry in South Australia and employ many thousands of people. China's new wine tariffs will devastate many businesses and people across the state. Already there are reports of jobs being lost and businesses cutting back in the new year. And just today, the ABC has reported China is adding more restrictions even on Australian beef. What support is the government putting in place to protect South Australian businesses and South Australian jobs from the Chinese tariffs? Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Mr President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator Griff for his question, and I know his strong interest, uh, as is mine, and indeed uh, I suspect this is an interest shared uh, by all South Australian senators and by senators from all wine-producing states across Australia about the concern we have around the imposition by China of provisional anti-dumping measures of between 107 per cent and 212 per cent on Australian wine imported into China. Uh, our government again reiterates that we are not aware of any evidence that Australian wine exporters have dumped their product in the Chinese market. Indeed, to the contrary, our exporters have worked hard to establish themselves as reliable suppliers of premium wine to the China market. Uh, they have done so selling at, on average, the second highest price point in the China market, uh, for which uh, China is, for Australian exports of wine, uh, the highest large price point market demonstrating that, far from dumping, we absolutely send premium product at premium prices into that market. We are working closely in response to these issues with the Australian wine industry to respond to use the 10-day window provided by the Chinese Ministry of Commerce for a response to their findings and to support the Australian industry in their response to these investigations. We also continue to work closely with industry to seek to pursue every other opportunity for Australian exporters to be able to tap into the rest of the world. Under our network of trade agreements that our government has negotiated, Australian exporters have opportunities in countries like Korea and Vietnam, in the United States under previous FTAs, in Japan as of next year, to be able to export wine duty-free, tariff-free into those markets. We want to support them to grow those markets as we aspire to do so in other markets around the world too. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, job losses will be concentrated in a handful of South Australian regions, such as the Barossa 
and McLaren Vale. Now, the Commonwealth has historically established regional adjustment funds to assist displaced workers in specific areas. These funds stimulated local investment, offered retraining and provided employment services. Will the minister commit to, to supporting workers with a wine industry adjustment fund? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, we provide, uh, provide a range of, uh, of measures to support the wine industry in terms of their uh, marketing and access to, uh, to uh, other sales opportunities around the world. Uh, we do that through the wine equalisation tax rebate uh, that, uh, that sees in the case of most small wine producers them paying no net wine equalisation tax at all. Uh, we do that through funding and support provided uh, to Wine Australia that uh, helps and enables exporters to be able to grow and reach uh, into other markets around the world. Uh, our commitment is certainly to continue to work closely with the Australian wine industry, who has shown great resilience and adaptability uh, over a period of decades. Uh, it's an industry that has seen uh, surpluses and vine pools, as well as uh, shortages and planting schemes. And so uh, it knows that these challenges come from time to time. I am confident that by standing alongside them, we will be able to help them pivot to other markets and pursue those other opportunities. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Uh, so I'll take it, Minister, that you won't commit to supporting uh, with a wine industry adjustment fund based on your answer. We've now experienced a damaging series of trade disruptions across many sectors, sectors, with the government's approach primarily being reactive. Does the government accept the need for a proactive approach to building resilience? And you did mention resilience uh, previously, Minister. And if so, what actions are you planning to take? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator Griff. Uh, the, the resilience in terms of opportunities for Australian exporters comes from uh, the range of opportunities and avenues that, uh, that are available to them. When our government was elected, uh, around 27 per cent or thereabouts of Australia's exports uh, were covered by preferential ta tariff access into export markets. As a result of the work we have done, not just through the China FTA, but by negotiating FTAs that give preferential access into markets like Japan, the Republic of Korea, Canada, Mexico, Vietnam, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Peru. These are a range of markets for which we have provided opportunities and avenues for Australian exporters to enjoy a comparative advantage. We stand alongside them through our export market development grants, through the work of our Austrade officers, through a range of other support to help them grow their exports, which they have done across a range of markets, Order. which we will Senator continue Birmingham. to support them to do. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, Senator Birmingham said that the robo-debt scheme, and I quote, obviously had issues. When did the Morrison government first become aware that the robo-debt scheme obviously had issues? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, uh, as I did yesterday, I refer the Senator to the answers that, uh, that Senator Rustin has given on those matters. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Was the government told in a department, department brief on or around 1 March 2017 that a third of robo-debts had been reassessed and reduced to zero dollars? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr President, in relation to a, a particular departmental brief of a particular date, uh, I will take that on notice, uh, Mr. President, and, uh, and seek to provide uh, a response to, uh, to the Senator. Uh, I would reiterate uh, in this matter that it is important for governments to be able to ensure that taxpayer dollars, where they are paid out, are paid where they are validly, validly meant to go. And in relation to in relation to our government, we have acknowledged on this program that there was a need to refund certain payments and to correct in relation to those issues. We equally, Mr. President, we equally, Mr. President, stand Order. by the need to make sure that taxpayer dollars are respected and that the Commonwealth recoups those where they have been wrongly claimed. Order. Senator Kitching's final supplementary question. Did the government have information in January 2017 suggesting that up to 86 per cent of robo-debts issued had to be reassessed? Senator Birmingham. 
Well, Mr. President, uh, our government has worked through these issues, which have been the subject of extensive questioning in relation to the dates that the senator refers, when particular information may have been provided, uh, and if there is something. Order, Senator Walt. Or Okay, Sarah Bell. Thing further in relation to the information I took on notice before uh, that I suspect has probably already been dealt with through Senate estimates, committee hearings, and questions that have been of a highly repetitive nature to Senator Rustin around dates and times. Order. But if there is something further to be provided Order there, I will left. make sure that is included in the answer I took on notice Order. before. But Mr. President, it does not negate Senators from on the my fact left. Senator that governments ought to make sure taxpayer do pay, to payer dollars go to the purpose for which they are intended, and our government will continue to do so where we can and where appropriate. Order. Order. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister update the Senate? on how the morrison mccormack government's plan to ensure reliable, secure and affordable energy will support jobs, particularly in my Northern Territory, as part of our economic comeback from COVID. Order. Order. The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator McMahon for her question, a passionate, a passionate Territorian who, uh, who knows full well uh, that the natural resources, the energy resources of the Territory uh, are crucial to its domestic economy and, indeed, to so many of its export opportunities as well. Uh, and indeed, our government is focused on delivering affordable, reliable energy to support uh, the economy, including the economy of the Territory, and new jobs. Affordable and reliable power will help to lower cost of living pressures on families, to ensure local businesses can grow and thrive, which, of course, in turn, helps to ensure that comeback of jobs and the economy across the board that we are seeing right now. Australia's competitive advantage has always been based on its cheap energy, and the right mix around renewables, gas and energy sources are central to our ongoing economic recovery and competitiveness. We expect to see those natural resources working effectively for Australians, and a key part of this is to deliver to Australians, to industry and businesses who rely upon it, the gas resources that are necessary at the right price. Our focus is on unlocking supply, ensuring efficient transportation and empowering Australian consumers. We know that gas is a critical enabler of Australia's economy, supporting a manufacturing sector employing 850,000 Australians across the board. We know also that the Territory relies on gas generation to keep the lights on, with almost 60 per cent of electricity generation in the Territory coming from gas. And though that mix may change over time, it is an important part of any transitional growth in the renewable sector as well. The Territory is in a prime position to take advantage of the opportunities and benefits of gas. With a skilled workforce, this can grow to both onshore and offshore development opportunities. It can help with the transition in terms of a lower emissions future without imposing new costs on businesses but whilst growing Order, jobs Senator and Birmingham. opportunities across the territory. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister outline to the Senate how our government is investing in new energy technologies that will benefit Territorians? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. We know that, uh, for example, uh, reform or, um, initiatives like microgrids can help to reduce electricity bills in regional and remote communities helping those communities to adapt and achieve innovative technologies or distributed energy sources like solar and batteries and to reduce their reliance on costly diesel generation. Round two of our Regional and Remote Communities Reliability Fund opens on 16 December and will help fund feasibility studies that will look at establishing a microgrid or upgrading existing off-grid technologies which would better meet the electricity supply needs of regional and remote communities. Under round one of the program, $5.5 million was delivered for the Territory across five grants in 25 different locations. We have also invested more than $2 million through ARENA in the Alice Springs Future Grid project, which aims to overcome barriers to generating renewable energy and support affordable renewable energy for 30,000 residents in Order. Alice Springs Senator and communities Birmingham. up to 130 Time kilometres away. Expired. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Can the minister please update the Senate 
on how our government is supporting gas developments, including in the Beetaloo Basin, that will drive down prices of energy for businesses and for consumers. Senator Birmingham. We thank Senator McMahon. As part of our government's policies there, we look to unlock, as I said before, new gas supply that can help to drive down prices for all Australians, particularly those job-creating Australian businesses and industries who rely upon it. Under our reforms, the Beedaloo Basin is one of the first of our government's five strategic basin plans. These plans highlight the ways that the gas development in the basin can be accelerated, and we welcome the opportunity to work with the Northern Territory government on this. Unlocking the Beedaloo is an exciting economic opportunity for the Northern Territory. It is a world-class province with an estimated size bigger than any other known gas resource off the northwest shelf. Early drilling activities confirmed the positive opportunities there, which could not only improve our gas security but also potentially Australia's fuel security as well. The development of gas reserves in the Beedaloo has the potential to generate billions of dollars for the territory economy and create over 6,000 jobs. This is great opportunity for Order, the territory, Senator and we are committed Time to delivering the answer upon has it. Expired. Senator Lambie. Order. Order. Senator Lambie has the call. Senator McKenzie. I just said Senator Lambie has the call. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. On 13 July, the Prime Minister changed the Special Operation Unit Citation regulations. He made it so that unit citations can be collectively or individually cancelled or individually forfeited on conviction for a disgraceful or serious offence. What was the Prime Minister's trigger for making these changes in July this year? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks um, Mr President. And, uh, uh, and indeed, um, if, we, uh, if we go back over the history of uh, some of the steps around citations, in, uh, in February 2018, I understand the then Minister for Defence Personnel sought approval to make a number of amendments to defence honours and awards, including in relation to recommendations from inquiries uh, by the Defence Honours and Awards Appeal Tribunal in 14 and 15 relating to withholding and forfeiture of awards. Uh, in May 18, the then Assistant Minister to the Prime Minister agreed to a full review of the relevant instruments. Uh, following extensive drafting efforts in May 2020, the Minister for Defence recommended a range of changes uh, to Australian Operational Service Medal, the Australian Defence Medal and Unit Citations, um, and, uh, and those were then given effect uh, in accordance with the normal process in July 2020. So, Senator, uh, Senator Lambie, uh, the point I guess of going through that history is, uh, is that in fact it dates right back if we, uh, to 2015 when a full review of defence honours and awards, medals and instruments uh, were undertaken. Uh, the review was undertaken in order to strengthen and expand the eligibility for certain awards, uh, uh, to reflect previously agreed recommendations of the reviews of tribunals, as I referenced, and to ensure consistency in terminology and definitions. They were the reasons for those changes, uh, Senator. Uh, I, uh, I, as I did last week, I want to make sure in relation to all of these matters that, uh, that I restate uh, very much the fact that uh, our government, I know you, uh, and indeed I am sure all members of this place, um, acknowledge uh, the service and sacrifice uh, of those who have served us, uh, including in Afghanistan, uh, and that the overwhelming vast majority have done so with pride, distinction and honour. Order, Senator Birmingham. Senator Lambie, a supplementary qu question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. So we all know about um, we all know about the report, the Brereton report back in 2015. So just when you decide to change all this, it seems the, these timings are starting to line up. Did the Prime Minister consult with the Chief of Defence Force or the Defence Minister before making any of those changes? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, in uh, as I said, in stepping through uh, the process there, the the changes that uh, that were made in July of 2020. Uh, were a function of quite a long process dating back uh, some six years. Uh, so there were extensive consultation opportunities uh, through that time uh, from the 
original recommendations of the reviews by the Defence Honours and Awards Appeals Tribunal in 2014 and 15, uh, and then subsequent opportunities for consultation, uh, which were certainly undertaken uh, by the relevant agencies of government. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Prime Minister's changes were the first time the regulations for this citation have been amended in 30 years. Why, after 30 years, were these changes made a few months before the Brereton report was handed down, and is that just a coincidence? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, indeed, the processes around these, starting in 2014 and 2015, actually began before the Brereton report was even commissioned. Um, so, uh, so it certainly is the case that the initial instigators, if you like, of these changes in relation uh, to uh, citation and award practices dated back prior to uh, the commissioning of the Brereton report. Uh, the changes were made well before that report was completed and before the Prime Minister was briefed on it. Uh, the Prime Minister was only briefed on the content of that report in November of 2020, uh, some months after the changes had been made in July of 2020. Uh, Mr President, uh, the government understands the extreme sensitivities in relation to these matters. Uh, it is why we expect them to be handled with sensitivity uh, and why we uh, are at pains to stress and reinforce the fact that we have nothing but the highest of regard for the exemplary service of the vast Order. majority Senator of Australian Birmingham. service Time men and the women. Answer has expired. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. How many older Australians in their 80s and 90s are still waiting for their approved Level 4 packages because the Morrison government have left them behind? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator. Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I don't have the exact number for level four with me, but Mr. President, the number of Australians waiting on, on the national priority list for aged care home care packages is just under 100,000 as of uh, the beginning of no November. I don't have the breakdown for each level, Mr. President. But, uh, Mr. President, that number Order. of people who are waiting for home care packages has, of course, reduced significantly over the last uh, 12 months or so since March last year. Mr President, when in March last year the number of people waiting for a home care package was about 129,000 people, Mr President, it's now under 100,000 people at uh, about 98, 98 99,000. And that, Mr President, is because of the significant investment that we have put into the home care sector uh, over recent years, Mr. President, $4.6 billion Order. invested into home care packages, Mr. President, since the 18-19 budget. Uh, 23,000 packages at a cost of $1.6 billion over the forward estimates in this year's budget, Mr. President, announced just recently, and of course, 6,105 new home care packages announced in July as part of the economic mm. statement that we announced in July. So almost 30,000 new packages this financial year, Mr President. So from when we came to government in 2013, when there were only 60,000 home care packages in the system, there will be 185,000 packages in the system uh, by the time we get to the end of this financial year, Mr President. So, Mr President, I'm happy to come back to the chamber with the exact number of people on a level four package that are, that are on the uh, national priority list. As I've said, the, number on, the total number on the national priority list is about 99,000. Senator Polly, a supplementary question. Mr President, why is the minister still sending letters to older Australians to advise them that they've been assigned a home care package, even though they've passed away 12 months ago? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, it is... Um, very unfortunate that some people uh, receive letters, and I've had communication with some of those families myself, Mr. President, that have received a letter uh, offering a home care package or about a home care package. In some circumstances, it's to inquire whether they intend to take up their allocated home care package after they've passed away. But, Mr. President, unfortunately, the responsibility for notification of deaths goes through. Uh, state systems, and sometimes, Mr. President, Order. sometimes, Mr. President, it takes. Order, Mr. President, uh, and 
uh, and sometimes it takes some time for those notifications to pass through to the Commonwealth, Mr. President. So this is not this is not as Order. the opposition. This is not as the opposition might like Order. to try and portray some sort of blame shifting exercise. It's a, it's, it's a fact that Senator sometimes Wong. the systems take Senator time Rennick. to report through to the system, Mr. President. Order. I Senator have Colbeck. asked, Mr. President, time on a for the of answer questions. has expired, even though I struggled to hear it. Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. How many letters has the minister sent to older Australians advising they've been assigned a home care package after they've sadly passed away? Can you now promise that no more grieving families will receive these distressing letters? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, unfortunately, I'm not able to guarantee that no further families will receive such a letter. Um, unfortunately, I have asked to be able to be able to do that on a number of occasions, but unfortunately, uh, the flow of data doesn't give me the capacity to be able to do Order. that. Senator on a point of order. Yes, Mr. President. The uh, question that I asked initially was, "How many letters have you sent out?" Senator you haven't Polly, even attempted Senator to Polly, answer Senator that. Polly, please. That 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 was that, that quite frankly was an abuse of a point of order. There was no way the minister could have been more directly relevant to the answer. I'm not. I am. If people don't make an attempt to make a point of order on direct relevance, I'm going to clamp down on a simple restating of the question. The minister was being absolutely and utterly directly relevant to the question asked. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and, and look, uh, my condolences to any family member who has lost a loved one. Um, and it is, and, and, and I have to say, I am sorry that people do get such letters after their family members have passed away. Uh, they have my sincere condolences and apologies. That is not the way we would like to be able to run the system. But unfortunately, sometimes notifications into uh, my aged care. Take some time, and these sorts of uh, the, and those letters are sent out, Mr. President. Mr. President, um, I am happy to come back to the chamber and, and find a number that Senator Polly has asked for with respect to those letters. But, Mr. President, I can't guarantee that those letters Order. won't go Senator out in Colbeck, the future. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Molan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, uh, Senator Reynolds. Uh, can the minister provide an update on defence's international operations, deployments and engagements in 2020 to help make Australia more secure? Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Molan for that question and also for his service to our nation. This year has challenged all Australians as individuals but also as a nation. So in many ways, 2020 has also been a year like no other for defence. But Defence adapted very quickly in February and continued to work COVID-19 safe. Vital exercises and engagements have continued. 4,800 ADF personnel will have deployed overseas this year. The Air Force completed more than 53,000 uh, hours of flying. We have had uh, 25 ships at sea throughout the year. The Army undertook more than 100 international engagements activities involving 900 personnel. We have supported our Pacific family, including during humanitarian emergencies. Our, large, our largest regional presence deployment involved five ships and engagements with 11 regional partners. In 2020, we have concluded mentoring and training missions in both Afghanistan and Iraq. We continue to contribute to coalitions dedicated to defeating terrorism, including in Iraq and in Syria. And we are supporting our UN partners by contributing to peacekeeping efforts. I most sincerely thank all Defence and ADF members who have served domestically and internationally in what has been such a challenging year. But I especially thank all their families whose support allowed those in uniform and in the department to serve our nation with such great distinction this year. And I ask all Australians to spare a thought for our personnel deployed away from home, both domestically and internationally, this Christmas. And I thank them all for their service. Yeah, yeah. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. Uh, can the minister provide an update on the ADF's domestic activities, including defence assistance to the civil community in 2020? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. And 
This has been an extraordinary year for the ADF and defence in here in Australia. We've conducted the two largest ever domestic operations to support our nation in our nation's history. We have assisted thousands and thousands of Australians uh, throughout the year. First of all, Operation Bushfire Assist involved more than 8,200 ADF personnel. It was the largest ever mobilisation of the ADF in response to a domestic disaster. This included thousands of evacuations, transporting emergency services personnel, setting up shelters, delivering meals and so much more. While the embers were still burning, however, Defence started Operation COVID-19 Assist, which has now become our largest ever domestic uh, assistance operation. So far, as of today, over 11,000 defence and ADF personnel have deployed. Has expired. Senator Mullen, a final supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, as part of Defence's ex uh, uh, extensive assistance to the Commonwealth, State and Territory authorities uh, during this year, how has the Royal Australian Air Force's No. 34 Squadron helped to provide continuity of government uh, and our democratic processes in 2020? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank the Senator for the question. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of each and every Senator in this place here today when I thank most sincerely Air Force's 34 Squadron for its work supporting the parliament and executive government during the pandemic. More than 1,400 passengers, members of parliament and staff predominantly, have been transported over 267 legs. In the early days of the pandemic, we simply could not have been able to start the parliament without their safe and efficient service, their sense of humour, their adaptability and their commitment to this nation. So, On behalf of us all, I thank 34 Squadron for your service this year. You have kept our federal parliament and the government running this year. Thank you. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. The Morrison Government Controlled Public Accounts and Audit Committee found the administration of the $100 million sports rort scandal, and I quote, did not satisfy public and community expectations. Does the minister agree with the findings of the Government Controlled Committee, which includes Coalition Senators Chandler, O'Sullivan and Scar. Order. Order. Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank uh, Senator Green for her question. And Mr President, I thank the Senators and the House of Reps members on the Public Accounts and Audit Committee for their work on the, on the report, Mr President. Um, uh, the report was tabled in the House yesterday, obviously, and, Mr. President, uh, uh, the government will consider the recommendations in the report uh, appropriately, and then we will, as uh, process dictates, respond to the parliament, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, the report itself considered a number of um, programs as a part of uh, its consideration, uh, and uh, as I've said, Mr. President, we will consider the report in the usual manner and uh, make a government response, Mr. President. But I would say, in respect of the particular recommendations that both the ANAO made uh, and that were made in the uh, Public Accounts and Audit uh, Committee Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit yesterday, that the government has already taken a number of actions with respect to uh, the application of the government. Grant guidelines uh, and their alignment, Mr. President. The Sport Australia accepted all three recommendations that the ANAO made to them with respect to uh, the ANAO report, Mr. President, uh, and the uh, the government accepted the recommendation that was directed to uh, the government uh, and has put in place measures to uh, effect all of the recommendations Order. of the ANAO report, Mr. President, and recommendations in the report handed down yesterday had a very, very similar context, Mr. President. So we will consider uh, those. Order. We will consider those matters, Mr. President, uh, and we will report back to the Parliament in the usual way. Order, Senator Green, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Government Controlled Committee found there was, and I quote, 
significant uncertainty regarding the legal basis for the minister's role in approving grants. Does the minister agree that Senator Mackenzie should appear before the Select Committee on Administration of Sports Grants to explain her understanding of decision-making, including the involvement of the Prime Minister? Order. Senator Colbeck. M Mr. President, Mr. President, it's not up to me to determine what another senator does. That is, that is not my role, Mr. President. And Mr. Order. President, my understanding, my Order understanding on of my the left. Order, Senator Wall, Senator Watt. Senator Colbert, continue. Thank you, Mr. President. And my understanding is that uh, uh, Minister, uh, Senator McKenzie has provided a substantial submission yeah, to the committee. Uh, she's provided. Uh, uh, support to the committee with respect to their work, Mr. President. But it is not the role of one individual senator in this place, any individual senator, to dictate what another senator might do, Mr. President. We are all elected here in our own rights. We are all elected here in order, our own rights. Order, Senator Wong. Sorry, Senator Birmingham. A, a point of order, Mr. President. You have called Senator Wong to order quite a number of a times. A couple of times, today. actually, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Oh, Senator Wong? Yeah, well, on the point of order, I accept that, but it is not about one person. Senator it's about Wong, the Westminster system, Mr. President. Senator Wong, I had been calling you to order. Senator Colbeck, have you to continue? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so, my understanding of the circumstances is that uh, the, the committee's uh, written to Minister Mackenzie seeking her further assistance. Minister, uh, Senator Mackenzie, Senator Mackenzie will make, uh, clearly make a decision order, with Senator respect Colbeck. to Senator Colbeck. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator, Senator Green is on her feet. Senator Watt, Senator Pratt. Senator Green. If even the government controlled committee, which includes Senators Chandler, O'Sullivan, and Scar, acknowledges evidence of the favouritism shown to government seats and MPs and Liberal Party candidates in the allocation of sport grants, why can't the Prime Minister tell the truth? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I would characterise the report in the context that Senator Green tries to portray it here in the chamber today, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, having had a look at the report, having considered its recommendations, it talks about the processes of the operation of a number of grant programs, including the Community Sport Infrastructure Grants Program, Mr. President. Uh, so uh, we will consider the report. Uh, as appropriate, uh, and we will respond to the parliament uh, in the usual way, Mr. President. And I don't accept the characterisation of the mindset of my colleagues uh, on that committee that Senator Green tries to portray in her question. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs. Will the minister update the House on how the Morrison government is working to keep Australians safe from the threat of terrorism and violent extremist ideologies? The minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I thank Senator McLaughlin for the question. And uh, Mr. President, as you'd be aware, a fundamental priority of the Morrison government uh, is to keep Australia and Australians safe. Uh, despite the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. The reality is that the threat of terrorism has unfortunately not subsided. The Morrison government has, however, invested record amounts of funding in our law enforcement agencies. Uh, the investment we're making in, for example, ASIO, into Waztrek and other agencies within the Ho Department of Home Affairs, uh, it is directed at keeping Australians safe. We know that during COVID-19, Many terrorist organisations have sought to exploit the increased time that Australians have spent at home and online. Targeting young and impressionable minds, they have shamelessly exploited this situation to propagate information, ideologies and dangerous and destructive views that seek to do real harm to Australians, not only in our country but across the Western world. What we have unfortunately seen in Paris, in the United States, across Asia uh, and the Middle East are the sort of atrocities that these people would seek to perpetrate in Australia and on Australian soil against innocent men, women and children. As a government, we need to ensure that we are able to deal with the threat of terrorism whenever, 
it may eventuate. Since September 2014, we have had 117 people charged as a result of counter-terrorism operations, and there are 22 people currently before the courts for terrorism-related offences. These are people that would seek to do significant harm to Australia and Australians. But the Morrison government is working night and day to make sure they are not successful. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. How is the Morrison government investing to keep Australians safe online and protect Australia from increasing cyber security threats? Senator Cash. Uh, Mr President, Australia's cyber security capabilities are strong, uh, but as we'd all be aware, the threats we face online are increasing. It is estimated that a significant cyber attack impacting Australia for four weeks could cost the economy as much as $30 billion and an estimated 163,000 jobs. As part of our 2020-2021 budget, uh, the government will provide an additional $202 million to deliver the 2020 cyber security strategy, creating a more secure online world for all Australians. This now takes the government's total funding for the strategy to $1.7 billion to provide a cyber security uplift that is fit for purpose in the involving online environment. Uh, this strategy will protect Australians, their businesses and, of course, the essential services that we all depend upon. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. As Australians begin to travel again over the Christmas period, what will the Morrison government be doing to ensure that they can enjoy their holidays and reunite with their families safely and securely? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, since the Morrison government was elected to office, we have now passed 20 tranches of national security legislation. This legislation has ensured that Australia has the most modern and up-to-date laws that deal with the reality of encryption and the ways in which terrorist groups conceal their influencing activities on the internet. Uh, this is supporting our law enforcement agencies to dis uh, detect and disrupt threats as soon as possible for the safety of all Australians. All Australians should be reassured that over the Christmas period and over the New Year period, uh, our officers will be working 24 7 on the front line. And there are, of course, many people in the Department of Home Affairs who will be supporting them in that work. Uh, on behalf of uh, the government senators, I would like to commend those officers for the work they do to keep Australia and Australians safe. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take oh, a note. Um, Senator Keneally, sorry, I think Senator Colbeck is uh, seeking the call. Thank you. Minister. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, Deputy President. Just in response to the questions from Senator Polly, uh, the number of people on the national priority system uh, as at 1 December for a level four home care package is 14,375. 14,375. Mr. President, uh, sorry, Madam uh, Deputy President, and unfortunately, I'm not able to give you a number for the people who have received letters for home uh, regarding home care packages uh, subsequent to their family member passing away, because that figure does rely on being that the uh, that being reported back to uh, the government. So we don't have. Uh, full information on that because that does rely on people reporting that back to us um, uh, at, the, at this point in time. Thank you, Minister. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Wong. Senator Wong, raised with Senator Birmingham, the fact that yesterday in question time the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, in the other place, Stated a falsehood. Stated a falsehood. And this is often the way with this Prime Minister on his feet in question time, just throwing out accusations without basis, without foundation. What did he claim? He claimed that the former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, had been going in and out of Australia, taking up quarantine spaces from stranded Australians. 
No such thing ever happened. The former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, has been in Queensland since March. He has not left the country. He has not taken up a quarantine space from a stranded Australian. But I will tell you which former Prime Minister is taking up quarantine spaces that stranded Australians are not being able to use. Senator Ciccone asks, which one? Which one? Former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. Former Prime Minister Tony Abbott traveling overseas, not on Australian government business, on UK government business, on UK government business, going overseas, coming back, taking up a quarantine space, going overseas again, coming back, taking up a quarantine space. That is two stranded Australians who will not spend Christmas with their families because of former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. Not former Prime Minister Rudd, as Scott Morrison falsely claimed, but former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. We haven't heard about that from Scott Morrison. Now, two spaces, you might think. Well, what's two spaces? Let me tell you something. The number of stranded Australians has grown and grown and grown. On the 18th of September, the Prime Minister promised 26,000 stranded Australians on DFAT's list would be home by Christmas. Only 17,000 have made it back. There are some 9,000 people who are on that DFAT list on the 18th of September who literally have two days to make it back to Australia, go through quarantine and get out to be able to celebrate Christmas with their families. And of course they have a hope of celebrating Christmas with their families. The Prime Minister promised it would happen. Now when the Prime Minister makes a promise, maybe the people of Australia should be able to rely on it. As a citizen of Australia, you should be able to rely on your Prime Minister's promises. And when he looks down the barrel of a camera and he says, I'm going to get all those stranded Australians home by Christmas, well, of course, stranded Australians think they can rely on that. But what do we know about this Prime Minister, Scott Morrison? He has trouble telling the truth. He's all about the headline, never about the delivery. Always there for the photo op, never there for the follow up. And it is cruel. In this circumstance, it is cruel. There are stranded Australians. As Senator Gallagher and Senator Watt and I on the COVID committee have heard, there are stranded Australians who are trying to come back to this country. They've been trying to come back since March. They have had flights cancelled. They have spent tens of thousands of dollars, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars, trying to get flights back to Australia. They have lost their homes. They have lost their jobs. They are being sent to homeless shelters. They are living off food banks and charities. They are running foul of visa conditions in other countries. They are facing a northern hemisphere winter in the middle of a global pandemic. It is un-Australian to leave your mates behind. But that is precisely what the Prime Minister Scott Morrison is doing. He is leaving Australians behind. He has made them a promise and he is breaking that promise. And he is breaking their hearts. So when you see photos of the Prime Minister on his social media, putting up his Christmas tree, sitting around his Christmas lunch with his family, well, good for him. I am happy and I wish the Prime Minister and his family a Merry Christmas. But when we see those photos, let us not forget that there are now 40,000 stranded Australians stuck overseas, barred from coming back to their country by this Prime Minister. And you know what? He has a safe COVID way to bring them back. Jane Halton, his hand-picked expert, has handed him a report that's told him how to increase quarantine capacity, told him that the federal government should take responsibility, told him the federal government should open up a quarantine facility with a human health response zone, told him that they had a responsibility to bring these stranded Australians home in the middle of a global pandemic. This Prime Minister has such a problem with the truth, and this Prime Minister is letting people down and leaving Australians behind. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Antic. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I, I have to say I, I enjoyed that, and I enjoyed it for the following reasons. Um, that was the very, very definition of the sound of straws being clutched at. Like you'd actually hear them hitting the ground. Those straws were being clutched at, and they were hitting the ground as you as you would expect. And, um, there were a number of uh, fairly flowery statements that were made there. And I did like—and I have to pay tribute to this one—bringing back the spectre of 
Uh, Tony Abbott, former Prime Minister Tony Abbott, gets a run on this one. And it's good to see the uh, Australian Labor Party uh, finding a way to bring him back in, even into this debate. Because I, I could do a few of those myself. I've still got an issue with Gough Whitlam and blue polls. So we can always go back and we can always run over that. But there are issues. There are issues that we need to. There are issues that we need to fact check because I know my friends on the other side of the chamber love an ABC fact check. Their mates at the ABC do a fact check. They do them all the time. I don't think they do them well. I'm going to do one well for you because there are a series of facts which are overlooked. And the fact of the matter here is that the Prime Minister has made the statement yesterday he's corrected it. It happens. The truth of the matter is that this government has helped innumerate numbers of people return to Australia during what has been a very, very difficult period. And I know that the, my friends opposite do like to ebb and flow when it comes to understanding the very difficult, difficult nature of this period, this COVID-19 pandemic. This has not been a run-of-the-mill uh, plane to go and collect some people overseas. We've seen over 432,000 Australians return from overseas since the government recommended that people reconsider the need to travel abroad back in March. 432,000 people. Now, my friends across there uh, on the other side of the chamber like to make it sound like everyone's just been abandoned. Everyone's just been abandoned. The government's just dropped hands and left everyone stranded on various different hotspots. It's just not the case. Uh, the fact is the COVID-19 pandemic is still, as we speak, not over. Another fact for my friends on the other side of the chamber. And the government's continuing to support Australians overseas, while at the same time managing that delicate balancing act of pre protecting Australians' health and safety and the community at home. And since the 18th of September, we are talking two months ago, 43,000 Australians have been returned home. 43,000 Australians. Once again, that's a fact check, not an ABC fact check, but a real one. Over 17,000 of these passengers have been registered with DFAT, including more than 3,700 vulnerable Australians. Um, what this means in real terms is that during the pandemic, 32,000 Australian citizens and permanent residents have returned home on over 370 flights. That's 370 flights in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, that is not just sending a Cessna down to collect a couple of mates down at the RSL Bowls Club on Kangaroo Island. 76 of these flights have been direct, directly facilitated by the government, and they've gone into difficult locations such as Peru, South Africa, India and UK. And let me say that negotiating uh, the borders, negotiating the uh, experience with those different governments has been no mean feat. The government has delivered and it has done it well. Twelve commercial flights have been facilitated by the government since 23 October, returning 1,700 passengers. Now, this includes a facilitated flight uh, with Qantas from Delhi to Hobart that landed uh, just this last Sunday with around 120 passengers. Once again, at the risk of repeating it, these are facts, uh, not ABC facts, but facts. Um, uh, 39,000 Australians are currently registered with DFAT and wish to return home. Now, some may not take up the immediate option to return, while others may seek to return home uh, at a later date due to particular circumstances. That, that is the nature of the ebb and flow of the situation that DFAT and the government finds itself in uh, in the middle of this pandemic. The DFAT administered hardship program um, has actually distributed over $10 million to 1,900 Australians overseas, covering the cost of accommodation, subsistence, um, flights as they may be. Uh, Australians have been as well catered for as can possibly be expected during this very difficult time. Uh, it is just incorrect to try and politicise this, to try and raise the spectre of pr uh, Prime Minister's past, to do whatever other straw-clutching exercises we have seen. Um, this government's allocated $60 million to support Australians to return home. Melbourne Airport, the second largest, um, has been taking international arrivals since July. Um, and DFAT, uh, of course, uh, will not remove any Australians from its registration database without its consent. This program continues. It continues to bring Australians home and it continues to do so in a timely and safe manner. Thank you, Mr. Um, Senator Antic. Your time has expired. Senator Gavitcher. Uh, thank you, Madam, De Acting, uh, Madam Deputy President. And I, I look forward to the time when Senator Antic's training wheels come off and he can get through five minutes without a heap of notes. But I've got to take one exception. I mean, blue poles, for goodness sake, it's worth 350 million. 350 million. It's got to be a good decision 40 years ago to buy that. But anyway, let's get back to the basics here. 
We have a Prime Minister who misled about the activities of a former Prime Minister. And obviously he did that on advice of his uh, department, which clearly was uh, errant advice. But instead of coming out looking down the camera and saying, I stuffed up, I made, a, I made an awful mistake there, I apologise for that mistake and moving on, I hear that he tables a letter in the parliament. He doesn't address the issue directly as Australians like to, like to see when you make a mistake, fess up, own up, apologise and move on. No, he tables a letter, tries to avoid the scrutiny of it. And you know, all of this angst that's on these Australians who are stranded far away in difficult circumstances could be avoided, as I said earlier in this week, if they allocated one tenth of the political will and finances that they did when they set up a regional processing facility in Nauru to take care of 657 people, they spent approaching $500 million in a year. Now, we don't expect $500 million to be dispersed around the globe to bring people home. They'd probably stay there if you did that. They'd take the million each and stay there. But the problem is there's no acceptance that human quarantine is a federal responsibility. And when the history of this pandemic is written, it'll be one of the failures of this government. They didn't set the responsibility at the appropriate place, take charge, set the standard all around the country, and as their own experts said, if necessary, set up a processing facility. They did it in uh, the irregular maritime arrivals area, stop the boats. Here they have the availability of aircraft, they could just lease them, sell the seats in them or whatever, get people to appropriate places, process them, 14 days allow them to get home. And as Senator Keneally and others have said, there are an immense number of Australians who are not going to see their family at Christmas. And I think that's the, to the Prime Minister's enduring shame. You don't promise if you can't deliver. I have no problem if he said it's too difficult to do it for Christmas. If it's, if it's logistically impossible or if he was cautious, but no, he had bravado and said, I'll have them all land for Christmas. And by the way, that former Labor Prime Minister's buggering the system up, taking up extra spaces. All erroneous. And he's not going to get people home for Christmas. And if I had relatives and family uh, stranded overseas, I'd be beside myself because some of the places they're stranded in, they're not in a good space. And I have cousins in England and the United Kingdom. And some of those cousins haven't seen their grandchildren for months. Newborn grandchildren in the same country. Can you imagine what it's like for a parent to have a child or a, a son, daughter or an aged parent overseas can't get home? I met someone in the parliament very recently. Their, their wife went to visit an ill relative in, um, in the United Kingdom and now it looks like March before she'll get a flight home. Now, they're mature people and they can conquer that distance, but, but it's not good. And we have a Prime Minister who promised. And we have a Prime Minister who says things which are totally wrong. And then avoiding scrutiny by taping on a letter is a very, very disturbing way for a Prime Minister to act. And if you look at what's happened with uh, the Honourable Matthias Cormann, take a plane, mate, take a plane. Just go and fly around all the places. You, you, you'll get COVID, so you better take a private plane. And it's a private job. I don't think it's a job that is obligated to Australia. I think it's his, his position. So why would he get a $4,300 an hour plane to go and get a private position? And that, that, that's got to be stood against the test of someone who's ill and wants to get home to their family for Christmas. And, and Australians looking at that, it'll be a fail, a total fail. So, you know, Prime Minister Morrison, and I don't say that he does everything badly, but he's obviously taken some really poor advice in respect to the former Prime Minister, the Labor Prime Minister. And the way you handle that, I think, is pretty low. Australians expect a higher standard. If that was Bob Hawke or someone else, they'd get up and say, look, I stuffed up. I'm really sorry. I made a mistake and I won't do it again and off they go. But to table a letter saying, oh, you know, I might have misled the parliament, that's very low standard. Thank you, Senator Gallacher. Senator Scar. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, I must say I agree with uh, Senator Gallagher in relation to his observation with respect to blue poles. I think, uh, I think it was, uh, and I did get an acknowledgement from Senator Gallagher as he left, I think it was actually a great investment and uh, 
Um, I, uh, I think it's probably worth somewhere north of $350 million uh, the current day. Um, this issue with respect to former prime ministers and travel. Now, I think it was, and, I, and, and my wife Louise, if she's watching, would remind me, I think it was about a month ago that my wife was walking our two rescued greyhounds, Chloe and Faye, and actually walked past our former prime minister, uh, Kevin Rudd. Uh, who uh, has a family member who lives in our suburbs so, and had a convivial exchange with him. Um, and it's a bit of a shame, it's a bit of a shame, Madam Deputy President, that we can't bring that conviviality with respect to former Prime Ministers into this place because I think they all should be treated. I think all former Prime Ministers should be treated with the respect that their service to our country commands. And I say that with respect to prime ministers from both sides of politics. And the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that when our prime minister became aware of the fact that a statement he made in the House of Representatives in response to a personal attack against a former prime minister in Tony Abbott, let's not forget that. Let's not forget that it was in response to a personal attack against a former prime minister in terms of in relation to Tony Abbott. In response to that, in response to that, our Prime Minister said something which was incorrect, and then at the first opportunity, at the first opportunity, he wrote to the clerk, and this is what he said. I'm writing to inform you that in question time today I made the following statement in response to a question from the member for Corio in relation to Australians returning home from the pandemic based on information I understood to be correct at the time. Quote, I thank the member for his question and wonder why he'd want to bring personalities into this that Mr Rudd has done the same thing, given that Mr Rudd has done the same, same thing. End quote. I have subsequently been advised that Mr Rudd has not travelled internationally during the pandemic and was not one of the 95,525 individuals who had been independently granted an exemption. The letter goes on. I also apologise to Mr Rudd for the statement and am pleased to correct the record. End quote. What is not transparent? about that, Madam Deputy President. What is not transparent about that? At the first opportunity, at the first opportunity, our Prime Minister corrected the record, corrected the record and issued an apology to former Prime Minister Rudd. I think that entirely meets the expectations of the entire of, of the Australian community with respect to how our Prime Minister should respond in such a, on such an occasion. And then when that issue is raised by Senator Keneally, she reverts back. She reverts back to attacking former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. She can't resist it. Senator Keneally can't resist the personal attack. She can't resist it. She reverts back to the personal attack on former Prime Minister Tony Abbott, who is not in a position, not in a position to defend himself in this place. He's not in a position to defend himself in this place. And then Senator Keneally makes a it was, it was quite a demeaning, sneering comment about the Morrison family celebrating Christmas lunch on Christmas Day. Totally gratuitous, totally unnecessary, does nothing to advance public debate in this nation, absolutely nothing. And it represents all about politics, all about that type of politics which Australians are absolutely fed up with. Sure, let's talk about let's talk about the priority of getting Australians home. Absolutely. And I've spoken to Australians trying to get home. I've spoken to their families. I've done everything in my office to facilitate that. And I actually give my congratulations. I actually give my congratulations to our staff and personnel within DFAT with respect to everything they've done in response to this one in 100 year pandemic i think they have been extraordinary in very difficult cases in very extreme circumstances let us not forget that melbourne international airport our second largest international airport in this country has been closed for months and months and months because of the debacle in victoria but you never hear that mentioned you never hear that mentioned on the other side. You never hear that mentioned on the other side. You don't hear mentioned about the impact that has had in terms of logistics, in terms of bringing Australian, Australians homes, home. I wish all my fellow Australians well as we lead up to Christmas and hope as many Thank of them you, get Senator home Scar. as possible. Your time has expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I think um, it's a bit unfair today that we're hearing the government trying to blame the opposition to try and raise, I think, is a very valid point 
which is why is it that the government went out publicly and made the offer, made the promise that they would be bringing all these Aussies home? And then to try and, you know, quite frankly, slur and put words in Senator Keneally's mouth that somehow it was her fault for raising this as a matter of importance today. I mean, come on. If we want to start to talk about the facts, Senator Keneally has been right from day one in setting the record straight. Why was it that the Prime Minister promised? promised people, promised families and gave them hope that they would have their loved ones in Australia by Christmas around the kitchen table. Because that's not going to happen to 40,000 Australians, and we know that. You know, the, the attitude from the government senators today, um, quite disappointing, in fact very dismissive and just lacking the acknowledgement that there is a problem. You know, is this the type of attitude that this government needs to set in terms of the standards that we all have to you know, accept going into Christmas and in, into the year 2021. You know, and for some facts, some fun facts, if you know, Senator Antic earlier on was talking about facts, well, the fact is that DFAT, DFAT released the details of 2,700 Aussies. Now, but you don't hear that coming across from the government side, do you? you know, and I know that DFAT staff are doing a great job and trying their best to get everyone back home, but the reality is that there are stuff-ups on the other side, and they need to acknowledge that. But you can't sort of come into this place, or in the other place, Madam Deputy President, and promise that we will bring back Aussies home by Christmas. And I'll give you another fact. You know, for us to bring all the Aussies back home by Christmas, so by Friday, so they have their 14-day quarantine, we need 82 A380s. 82 A380s. Now, unfortunately, Qantas only has 12 of them, but I'm sure the Prime Minister could pick up the phone, ring up the CEO of Qantas and say, look, let's get at least 12 of those out right now. Instead of sacking 2,000 workers, we can give more than 2,000 workers, not just their jobs back, but thousands of other people. Pick up the phone to Virgin, pick up the phone to other international carriers, and I'm sure we'll get a good rate, a good discount. So this is the type of attitude that we have to expect from the government. You know, it's their attitude, whether it's been with JobKeeper or JobSeeker or other government policies leading up to Christmas. And quite frankly, it stinks. All we want is this government to do the right thing by Australians, and that's what Australians expect. Um, I had a personal circumstance, a, 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 a constituent that reached out to me, um, his daughter had been stuck in Scandinavia. And he only just finally returned back in Sydney um, only a few days ago. But the point that he was raised with me was she tried 12 times, 12 times to get back to Australia. And it's cost them tens of thousands of dollars. You know, and as Senator Keneally had pointed out, you know, people are having to raid their, their savings. In fact, I think even some others have to take out money out of their super, superannuation accounts. Now, this is not the type of attitude that we would be expecting from any government. You know, I mean, governments are there to help their citizens abroad in times of you know, great need. This is why we all pay our taxes, to make sure that we have services, whether it's here in Australia or abroad. But yet this government just does not seem to care, just does not seem to care, and rather attack Senator Keneally and others on this side for somehow wasting the Senate's time. Again, just another very dismissive attitude. Um, with the, the one minute that I've got left, I mean, I just, I guess, from my point of view, we just have to make sure that going forward, going forward, there are, I guess, mechanisms put in place in how we go about handling uh, the pandemic. You know, um, in Victoria, and I said to Scott earlier, had mentioned about the uh, hotel quarantine situation in Victoria, in my home state, Victoria. You know, we had two passengers come off a plane in Sydney, made their way to Victoria. I mean, it sounds like Ruby Princess all over again. Yeah. yeah, but they're happy to blame the states. You know, blame the states because somehow it was the states that look after the borders. <laughs> I mean, if that's the case, I mean, what's the point of federation? What's the point of us being in this place? This is the federal parliament. In the constitution, it is crystal clear that the federal government has responsibility for our borders. And those guys opposite have lost all control. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Keneally to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. 
Thanks very much, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the response uh, to my question to Senator Birmingham. And I asked about the really sad state of the Great Barrier Reef. And a recent paper uh, published in Nature, a very reputable, in fact, the top scientific journal, that showed that because of the mass coral bleachings, uh, of which we've had three in the last five years, that half the coral cover of the reef was bleached so badly that it died. And I asked the minister, what is the government doing about the fact that half of the reef is dead? Because we know, the scientists tell us, dead corals don't grow back. I'm afraid I didn't get a satisfactory answer. I got the same answer I've been getting for the eight years that I've been asking about this in this chamber. We're doing a little bit, we're doing this, we're doing that, but it doesn't change the fact that half the reef is dead from lack of serious climate action. I saw the reef for the first time 30 years ago as a 12-year-old girl, and it was so powerful to see the colour and the diversity, the, the sheer wonder of the place, and that stayed with me ever since. What is so sad is that my kids won't get the chance to see the reef in that state. And in fact, none of the kids in this country might get the chance to see the reef at all at this rate, certainly not in 30 years' time, um, because of the trajectory that we're on um, with the weak and pathetic climate targets that this government has set. We know that climate change is the biggest threat to the reef. Yes, there are other threats as well. Yes, there's water quality concerns. Yes, there's crown of thorns. Yes, there's shipping problems. There's all sorts of issues that we need to confront, and, and all of those will improve the resilience of the reef to climate. But the biggest one is climate. The reef's own management authority clearly say that in, in your government's own documents. A report released last week by the um, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, um, who do a three-yearly uh, outlook, if you like, of the, uh, the health of World Heritage properties, of which the Great Barrier Reef is one, gave the reef the worst possible listing. It was downgraded to a critical state. Now, that is the last warning that we are going to get before the next international meeting of UNESCO, the World Heritage Committee, make a decision on the future of the reef and decide whether or not to list it on the in danger list, the World Heritage Sites in Danger. Now, the scientists would say that actually the reef belongs on that list, but the tourism industry would be decimated if the Great Barrier Reef is listed, listed as in danger. And this government needs to do all it can to avert that potential listing, but it's not. I mean, five years ago, we saw them waste hundreds of thousands of dollars on flying diplomats around to try and bribe other countries to not shame Australia with an in danger listing. It worked for them that time, but our international borders are closed, so they can't do that sort of diplomatic lobbying, can they? I don't know what lobbying that they, will, uh, they will do between now and when the uh, World Heritage Committee meets, but what they do clearly need to do, and what all of the scientists and all of the relevant bodies are telling them, is they need to act on climate. They need strong 2030 targets. We need an actual climate plan, not just to save the reef, but to save our future economy, to provide jobs for future generations, to save agriculture, to save the Murray-Darling. It underpins everything. And yet this government just is not engaging. They are hostage to the, the dinosaur denialists on their backbench. They're hostage to the donations that they get from the fossil fuel sector. Um, they're lured by the, the promise of well-paid lobbying jobs in that same fossil fuel sector once they leave politics. And meanwhile, half the reef's dead. It's not good enough that you've got a pathetically weak, underfunded 2050 reef plan which um, doesn't plan your way out of anything and certainly doesn't uh, address the climate crisis. It's underfunded to orders of magnitude. It barely mentions climate. In fact, the first draft didn't mention it at all. And it's been routinely criticised for not being strong enough. And the fact is it's not turning around the trajectory uh, for the health of the reef. We've got this one last chance. This is one of the seven natural wonders of the world. We don't have the right to write its death warrant. And when half of it has already gone, this government must listen to the science, adopt strong 2030 emissions reductions targets, and do what's necessary to give the reef any chance of survival. Please. 
please listen to the scientists. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.